I we collected this um, presentation uh, according to the week we spent here with the student. So I will first present a little bit this kind of hybrid context between space, architecture, technology, art, psychology. And uh, then I'll give some examples of, uh, of work that I've done, some kind of personal work, some of it is part of research. Um, and then I will just dive into what is really important, just one, one project and the process really breaking into all the mistakes and all the sketches on the way. Um, as, um, as something to think about when we're going into a project, just kind of like uh, liberating the, the creative process and looking at those things from different um, angles. So yeah, so a little bit about <coughs> the context. And fortunately for me, in the last few years I've been in the research context, which is, I find a little bit more open than uh, many years that I've been in more commercial context. Um, so uh, lucky me, but now I'm going back to the commercial world and just keeping it as a little bit of teaching. Um, my background is really like hardcore architecture. For five years I've been uh, practicing like a senior architect, building lots of buildings, planning urban, uh, urban design. Um, and only then I went into the search of uh, innovation and how this could kind of change our life. And I came to that with a very kind of uh, both practical kind of questions of how this could change our life in the city, but also a little bit of um, uh, looking for, uh, for the, the additional value in terms of what, which kind of spaces we could have and how this could affect our culture in the uh, urban space mostly. But then as I started learning in Iva, I found myself falling in love in the, with the tangible object and this brought me to many uh, um, future projects that uh, I just found easier to kind of grasp and faster uh, to move on with the research. So I, in, in this slide I kind of admit that I reached some very serious hard questions when uh, conflicting uh, technology in the uh, urban space and, uh, and this is why I'm so uh, interested in your work now. So basically there are like those kind of three big topics um, whether it's whether it's uh, space, people and technology and in the middle what I see and this is really my personal point of view of what is for me interaction design and I, I kind of pair them with the, the disciplines behind them but it's not necessarily those disciplines it's really the thinking of space, the thinking of people or through people and the thinking through technology and um, it goes deeper into smaller kind of uh, topics in them, which I can say this is like the work that I've been doing in the last five years, from uh, um, from smaller kind of like, for example, for for a while I was only doing ethnography kind of work. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but this whole research of design that is coming from ethnography was uh, was kind of my main uh, practice, um, but. I see it as a whole, it's like, we look at interaction design, usually we think interaction design, interface, technology, and if we say, if we're looking for this kind of bubble with the people, we say, okay, now we have social, and then this is how social looks. But for me, what is interesting is to look at the context of this, and really try to think of this picture. Because something fundamental change with technology and we are often not seeing it because we're so much in love with what it gives us. So there's this trade-off that we notice and we accept and it's fine and I'm not, I'm not um, trying to, uh, to change, to, to go backwards to what it used to be but I think that it's important to notice those things, to kind of uh, place those trade-offs and to see that maybe now that we're so occupied with a new kind of interaction with our friends and we're texting and we're completely obsessed and immersed, we are having fun and it, it doesn't mean that it's wrong but 
Then, yes, Marcel, I'm talking to you. <laughs> you just said something about having fun. Exactly. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but it's, it's exactly those questions that are interesting for me and, and, and what I try to create is like to, to bring different new objects to the table that would allow us to try something else and sometimes it's not useful, it's just a tool of research so it could be perceived sometimes as a piece of critical design but I really see it as a, as a, as a tool in the part of a larger research that we are on the way to kind of get to know these things. So, just an awareness of this uh, innovation. So basically, I would place my work now fairly much coming from this side of sociology, um, often using um, theories of psychology, uh, sociology, and uh, my main tool is uh, ethnography. So let's go through some examples of projects. Um, I got this title from one of the professors teaching with me. They kind of called, okay, Dana, what you're doing is hybrid. We call, we'll put you under hybrid. You're doing the hybrid class. You're doing that. And at first, I kind of hated it <laughs> because it seems like, uh, come on, you could have thought a bit deeper and find something better than just you're the mixed thing. But I think it's um, it's a good way, it's a good like uh, word to use in order to look widely on the process that we're doing and uh, this kind of context, um, especially in the school now I see the debate is a lot about the, the discipline, the multidisciplinary and the interdisciplinary and the transdisciplinary and I believe that that uh, in this field, some would say like the new media art, the interaction design, is exactly where you see those things. So it's important to have a good understanding of the discipline and then the relationship between them and when, when is the moment that it becomes interdisciplinary. Um, so the first project I will present was um, commissioned by uh, Droch Design. So they turned to us and Basically, they were looking at, um, at a very specific situation in Europe that more and more people are living by themselves. And they said, we would like to have to create a whole new experience for the single person. Because just like now we can go to the supermarket and buy everything in a very, very small packaging for one person, we would like to think in the same manner what what does it mean now that each person is living in his own little unit in the city? Which is quite, you know, we never noticed that, but in the past, of course, we used to be always in a family, always in some kind of a different space. And this space is not only the special, it really is like the behavior that is there. So they were trying to make a whole exhibition to exhibit objects for single people. And then we started doing an ethnography, looking at single people, coming up with the, with the, basically we had, often when we say single people, we think of something sad and lonely. And after doing this ethnography, both the Alejandro, my, my colleague Alejandro Zamudio Sanchez and me, we had lots of fun. <laughs> and we thought that, uh, this phenomena has a good reason to exist and we came up with a, a new approach to being single. <laughs> so we decided to make all our objects as such seen as, as like a campaign for loneliness, promoting loneliness, embracing solitude, and really thinking of the situation that you know when when you're dumped by your partner you can now use the whole bed as you wish and Try to see what is the good side of all those things. So again, we are always trying to approach with some sense of humor, a brief that even if it seems a bit sad or stiff, we can kind of come up with a silly ideas that that get a feeling of something there. So the first obvious thought was that yeah, maybe I'm uh, single, but I could have a, a chair that would be just much better than my partner, if it could be in friends, if, uh, if, if a chair becomes this kind of good creature that can stretch your back. We created the, 
basic movement on the back of the chair and we made a special pet under the seat that is mapped to the back of the chair. We of course designed a full set providing a variety of different relationships according to the one you want to have with your chair. Um, so if you want to have more extreme, tough relationship or you want to be more pampered and gentle, you could use the feather fingernail. And I created a very, very rough prototype with a servo motor that was moving accordingly. Here's a video. judge you according to the way your place looks, so you have to kind of keep it normal. But then we wanted to have a, a secondary layer that goes completely like crazy with whatever you want. So we created this slam that was a hybrid, half, half weapon kind of look, half um, standard IKEA lamp. Um, and basically as long as this lamp was hanged in the room, in uh, pretending to look normal, it had uh, a simple white light, and then as you grab the handle and you turn it, there is of course with a simple tilt sensor, it switches between the light, the normal white light, to uh, ultraviolet light, and then expose all this kind of like graffiti tagging that you would have on the wall. So. <coughs> Basically, this was like this kind of intimate layer that each one could have in his room. And then this was really fun doing the design for this land because we got into the details. The first one was like, how do you show that there's a handle? Second is like, how if I want to now just spray my walls with my invisible ink, I need to, I need someone to hold this lamp for me, right? It's kind of contrary to the concept, so we made this kind of weird looking hook at the top so you could place it this way, so whenever it stays like this you could paint on the walls and um, create your own real environment, including some of us who like to wear moustache. And then another project that was quite successful and was uh, now it's part of the collection in the Dolph design is, um, is a blanket. This was like one of the only things that were really like uh, notable uh, in almost crossing all the um, ethnography research that we've done. When people arrive to their home, this kind of like the, the coziness of the home was something that is very, uh, was very uh, important to people and many times actions that could perceive as lonely and sad got suddenly uh, a whole different ambience when someone is just taking this kind of blanket instead of like watching by yourself on the TV when you're covered with this it's suddenly like hmm, you're creating this kind of personal escape around your body so we used this kind of first image mixed a little bit with the image that we had of Charlie Brown or Linus and his security blanket and the whole of the 
the theory of uh, Winnicott about the uh, transitional object. And we kind of looked into this object of security and how this thing could be at the same time like this kind of old style, old school security blanket of, of children, but you're adult and what could this provide you next? So we used this um, um, Wi-Fi, uh, basically wirelessly uh, connected through radio sound system and uh, each button on this blanket was a speaker and as it vibrates on the body it gives this kind of very interesting uh, feeling. The idea was that you could wrap this thing around you and just uh, whether it's connected to your DVD and you're watching a film, whether it's connected to your music, you can just grab it, go with your own sound system to the kitchen, let's say, make a cup of tea, coming back. You always have this kind of sound that is carried on you, on your body, and you can feel it vibrating. Um, recommendation according to Alejandro Zabudio Sanchez are to use this blanket only when you're naked. Um, we put lots of uh, attention to the kind of interaction that you will have with this blanket. So the corners were kind of personalized, humanized, I don't know, um, animated as animals. And those kind of created this sort of um, shape, a bit cartoony shape that you would hold, you could grab it from both sides and this was like the control for the volume or the, the, the quality of the sound you would like to achieve. So pulling, kind of like tagging on those corners would change the levels of sound and vibration. And this was nice because this project was uh, exhibited many times. Here it is in the, in the Milano uh, Salone del Mobile with the Droch design. And you could see how people use it. So this was just um, basically was seated there on a chair, and people would come, would grab it, would create whatever kind of shape they want to be, and stay with their kind of own self soundscape. So this was kind of like one almost commercial, we can say, research. Another one was my own personal research that was um, at the time where we are forced to work for lots of telecom companies and most of the, the work we do is uh, regarding to how, to, how, how can we be more connected to others, more available. We find ourselves in a situation that, um, of uh, basically multi-communication all the time we're um, running between few channels of communication. So in this kind of uh, constant partial attention it was uh, uh, a term widely explored in the last five years, um, we have again this kind of trade-off because we gain something, no doubt about it, but we also lose a lot of things. And I was trying to challenge this, uh, this uh, concept and to see what could be a tool, like what are the objects or the agents that could become kind of a, a device to communicate with oneself. So how could we kind of, instead of just being focused all the time on all the other channels, is it possible to create some sort of a tool, some sort of an object that would cut you a little bit away from those kind of massive interruption and put you in some sort of a maybe meditative or kind of self-communication, self-attention place. So one, uh, one of the devices was Scuba, it was connected to uh, your mp3 player and it was wrapped with, uh, with kind of uh, textiles, spongy material so you could squeeze it as you're nervous and say you're taking the the subway or you're in, in a very um, noisy environment, what it would do basically, it would play you your breath. Okay, so there's a connection to your breath and it's a pretty much a similar experience to what if some of you are scuba diving, 
you know, this kind of the moment that you're connected to your your uh, breathing device and you go underwater and suddenly you have this kind of different acoustics, everything is a bit different. So what I try to do is to bring this kind of ambience, this kind of connection to oneself, medita meditative listening to one's breath, into the city, into environments that are more hectic, let's say. So the mic is picking up the breath, it goes through a sound processing unit and, and you hear it back in the um, headphones and as you squeeze you get more and more isolated from the noises of the environment and you have like noise cancellation which completely immerse you in this kind of experience. So this was a, um, a prototype that was done and tried for uh, uh, at least uh, one year by a few, uh, few of my friends and, and that was kind of nice because it's pretty simple to, to produce and then the, the experience is uh, something that should be experienced, meaning you cannot see it like this. Um, I think I have a sample of how it sounds. It, um, it's on a scenario, a little scenario, but really just listen to this. It, it sounds from the outside a little bit like Darth Vader. So it's, it's pretty hard to imagine these are the real recordings of the press. Learning a new language. Yeah. Do you want to okay. 
<laughs> okay. But then the important thing after you kind of figure out more the technical things um, is also to have your own personal interpretation. And this I think is the key to any of your project. Not only trying to solve the world and bring something that is more efficient or more intuitive, but really try to express something, especially now when you're in in school, I think it's a context that allows you to, uh, to explore something that is more uh, personal and sometimes it's just this kind of like tiny little thing that could bring things to, that, that, that you think it might be valuable only to you, but actually it has a more uh, resonance outside. So, the answer machine is just a device that collects messages in space where well, you are not there. So in a way it's like you have a butler, someone would say, or you have a dog in your home. So it really is about space. It really is about the location. It really is somebody is calling my home and I'm not there. So while I'm not there, there's this other creature, there's this other persona. So many times, like in many languages, you call it a secretary, right? And you imagine that there's like a human being or a secretary there. But more specifically, for me, it was interesting to see the kind of psychological relationship that we have with the answering machine and how we, re we react. So when, when I come back home and I check out my messages, what do I feel about that? It's a very similar feeling that today we feel when we open our computer and we see that we have like millions of uh, emails to answer or, you know, if we haven't been around uh, for a day and suddenly there are no emails. So we kind of think, oh my God, nobody wants us, are we alone? So this was like the first feeling that we were thinking of, like how you come back home and there are no new messages and you feel like, oh, nobody loves me, I'm so isolated, unwanted and unpopular. But what we wanted to, um, to um, let's say, pursue in this project was the other feeling that you have too many messages and you have too much stuff to do and it's this kind of like duties and hassles that are coming in. So that was basically our concept. It's kind of massive duties just accumulating uh, all over your, your desk, let's say. So we were trying to think how these kind of messages become this thing that occupies your personal space and you're just like, you, it, this metaphor becomes alive and you could use it as it is. So, we, this, this was like the main image that we hang up on the wall of the studio. And then we were thinking, okay, let's say the table can deform, it accumulates this kind of messages and, uh, and then we can interact with those messages, a little bit like along the lines of the famous answering machine of uh, the Bishop. So, we defined very clearly, and, and here it's really important for, for you guys to pay attention, reduce all the features, because immediately we were thinking lots of things to solve, but just reduce. Three things, that's all. It needs to record, What's happened when it records, what happened when we play, what happened when we delete it. This is it. That was all the project is about. So when a message is being recorded, a box, the surface of the table is just like pushing up. A box is coming out of the table and you can see one message there. So what it would mean that when you walk into the room and you see you have four messages, you see them as physical objects. In order to listen to a message, you open it, uh, a bit similar to a music box or something like this. You open, you hear the message. And in order to delete the message, you just push it back and in a way you kind of conquer your space back, your personal space is yours again. So those were the only three uh, interactions. Um, to give you kind of a, a rough estimation of time, this was defined, I think, in the second day of the workshop. And then like, we had to present, no, maybe the third day, and then we had to present some sort of first video prototypes and physical prototypes. So, very, very roughly, we've done something that looks as rough as it could be. Hi, Shonda. Um, yeah, you missed dinner. Uh, missed you, went out, came back from 
display or, or, uh, or distribute those boxes on the table and what is the meaning of something like this. So in order to do this, uh, you all know that you do fast, 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 kind of like tons of uh, models and you look at them and you take pictures of them and you put them and you look at them again and you say, okay, what is good, what is bad. And this is a super interesting moment, you say, here. I took these pictures. Again, it's all about the transformation from one medium to the other. When you build the models, or when I draw the sketches, I always look from the same point of view. When you use the camera suddenly, suddenly you see something that I didn't expect and I didn't think of. Because in all my sketches, I'm avoiding the problem of what's going on behind, under the table. Once it's in a photograph like this, Suddenly it's very clear that there's like this kind of like round zero place and there's the whole world that is going up here and the whole world that is under the table. And this brings my creativity to spin and I say, okay, now I got it. The creature is going crazy. The creature that we're creating here is not only a, a table which is an answering machine, but it's a real creature and every message is a leg of this table. And as I'm getting messages, my table starts to move around the house and it starts to go crazy. And those are all legs, so this is like amazing. Okay, we were very happy. We started sketching that, that the creature is going crazy, how, how this would be. How... And I remind you, there are three days to finish the project. So this is a super important point, I think, in creativity, that you have this idea that suddenly like all connect and see it will be perfect and you're really enthusiastic about it but there's a deadline and this is the constraint so sometimes you have those constraints and it's super important you know you have to finish so you keep this sketch for the next time you will be able to do something and you go back to do just finish the one concept that was simple to do so this was done in two and a half weeks and it was working and we were very happy. It was only two boxes, but it could receive phone calls, go up, it could uh, listen to the um, messages and delete them as we push them back to the table. So that's a first kind of like extreme uh, workshop process. Then after this we had the, the great opportunity to develop it further to an exhibition. So this that is really nice, you have a budget, you can have your own PCB, everything is nice, you don't need to kind of stick a uh, lot of breadboard under the table, um, you have nice materials, but also it changes some things in the design and in the concept. So one thing we had to kind of uh, give up here, this, this was a, a public relation photo, but uh, um, you could see that the, the proportion of the boxes changed. As you remember, we couldn't find more than two motors in the junkyard. So we had to find a solution that would be robust enough and that we will have plenty of. So we, were, we found the um, motors pushing, uh, basically we used um, the trays, like in computers that are pushing the CD in and out. And we said, okay, we'll just take those. We use them, this, hence the size of a CD. Um, and this way we know we have enough, we can replicate it, it exists in the market, we just do it, it will react differently because now in the previous one we, we could really push it and this one we had to uh, just touch it a little bit and it would go by itself a little bit like you do with the CD. Um, but we couldn't have the control over the height, so here we lost this feature. It's a trade-off. It's fine. It's something that is lost, but you have you have your uh, thing made. And then later we had even a fancier uh, version or laser cut and nicely done, merged into a Norman Foster's uh, table. But uh, yeah, and we can see. So this was like working. Thousands of people tried it, and. It was uh, surviving here again. This is the first one that was in the end of the workshop, done in the lab. Oh, no. 
that a lot and I think um, I think sometimes people say well it's just enough prototyping because usually it refers to the fact that uh, you know that it's enough to have like a, a bar of soap to know how uh, how an iPad feels or uh, it's enough to have the size or the material the thing is that I think it's super important is to remember that those should be all like lots of just enough for so even if each one just showed one tiny little part of the project, you should have plenty of them spread at the same time. And and yeah, and this is kind of like my view on uh, creativity because many researchers try to uh, to define the, the design process as something that you can develop something with time and it just goes and you evolve and evolve and evolve and in, a, in a graph like this, you know, that there are some bumps in the way but we evolve and evolve and at the end. So I I don't believe exactly in this kind of linear model. I, I'm not sure if you could have a model for a design process in general, but it's definitely not linear in, in such way. So what people mostly describe is something like this, where there were all kinds of things on the way that they would try, but at the end they followed something else and kind of like loops and uh, uh, failures on the way but I think it's more like that actually that there's like tons of stuff that is happening all at the same time so it's like all those material that you try and it doesn't work and like um, electronics that you burn and like lots of those stories that you kind of like you live out of the narrative at the end and and maybe it's like this that we should look at that process at all without like connecting the dot and the only reason why we connect it is to tell a story and just the parts that we remember. Yes. I would like to ask about the last project that you saw. How did you, let's say, the relationship between the first uh, object that you examined, which was, let's say, the generic object, and the final thing which becomes... What was the first? The first, uh, let's say, the answering machine that you observed and you tried to understand, let's say, it's a very object that you could have it everywhere, or yes. and then it evolved somehow in being a piece of furniture in its own, which is not the case for this device, let's say. Yeah. Did you consider that as a, let's say, additional attribute that this answering machine would have, or just that happened because of? No, I think. I think since the beginning I was interested how how this uh, answering machine has this kind of presence. You know what I mean? It's like it's it has this kind of physical presence in a way because somebody is calling me and leaving a message. I'm not there, but there's this someone, someone. There's the kind of ghost. There's this kind of persona. There is this device that is picking up and, and keeping this message for me. So I was trying to see how I materialize this. And maybe it's because I'm, I came before I came from a background of architecture that I immediately started spreading the table and like creating those buildings coming. Maybe it's because of that. I don't know. It could have been anything. Um, but I was interested in how this kind of thing translates into this invasion into space. So that was kind of uh, the thing. The, the specific object of a table it fitted well in this kind of metaphor of like, you know, those kind of like uh, bags, those kind of like hustles and duties that are just being accum accumulated on your table. So it kind of fitted as a metaphor. But I guess it could have been uh, anything else. It could have been the wall that is squeezing you. It could have been the chair that is, uh, I don't know, blowing on you and doesn't leave you much space to breathe. I don't know. 
Does it answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if it's, it was a name from the beginning to have it as an entity on its own, let's say. Because um, now it's becoming more... No, it was not clear. It was not clear that it okay. would be so... Kind of... became more and more. I mean, we, we ask ourselves, what is this thing? So we have to come up with let's say it does one box as well. The brief? The brief was not to redesign the, the S3 machine. It was a strange familiar, right? Uh, yeah, which is redesign. Uh, How was the brief defined? It was defined to redesign, to rethink. Rethink. Rethink the S3 machine. Object. Which is not redesign, meaning you, you were very much encouraged to just take one thing, one property out of it and do it. Mm -hmm. So it could have been enough to do a, a new telephone or, or, or something, you know, just take one little thing that you're, you feel that you're personally connected with and do it. Why, why was your lamp called KGB? Because ah, of the interrogation. <laughs> and we didn't do it, ah, we didn't do anything about the interrogative interrogate design for but uh, yeah, because of the um, interrogation mode of it, the way that it's like, you know, this, this kind of a look that it had when it was hanged with a white, very bright light, and you go from one side, a little bit like the image that you have of like rough interrogation. But yeah, again, all those names and all those um, things, Especially with Alejandro, which is the person I collaborate most with, uh, we are very, uh, we go very kind of like, we are very liberal about like naming things and just like trying to throw um, kind of different association into the object. It, um, it, it helps to kind of lighten up and uh, have fun and a bit of sense of humor around those objects. I can say that the, the, the project that I showed now, the, the table, was done with the, someone very, very serious, very much from the world of engineering, and, and I think what, what we talked about today in class is really important. The thing that the more you create those little models, those little sketches, you communicate better with your partner. And if you have a team or, or a couple working, you have to make sure the other side understand, and it's often, by the way, in this community of interaction design, it's uh, it's international, so the language is already kind of uh, challenged. But also, people are coming from different backgrounds. One is a programmer, one is an architect, one is a designer, one is an engineer. It's, it's really different. So the communication is needs to be found in things that are concrete, uh, physical sometimes. <laughs>